Well, it has been an eventful week in the political sphere once again, hasn't it? With the resignation of our Prime Minister, Liz Truss. Now, I try my best not to talk about politics in the pulpit, as the pulpit is for the commendation of God and his son, the Lord Jesus, not our earthly leaders. But I do think there is something that we can learn from Liz Truss's resignation that touches with our passage this evening. And that is what has become evident throughout the unfurling events of the last couple of months or so. And that is, we all value our futures. I think the main reason why Liz Truss resigned was because we, the public, perceived that our future was in jeopardy. Pensions were on the line, mortgage payments rocketed, and there was just a general feeling of nervousness, there still is, isn't there, in the air, as we, the public, grew worried about our economic future. Will we be left in ruin with no pension to draw upon? Will we have enough money to pay the mortgage repayments or our soaring energy bills over the winter? Will we have to borrow from our future to make ends meet in the short term? or perhaps our children's future, as the government increases its borrowing. Many of us perhaps don't think an awful lot about the future. Many of us perhaps take a more live-and-let-live attitude to life. But I think when we stop to think about it, it's clear that our future is a very precious thing to us indeed, and something that we feel ought to be protected at all costs. And I think the writer of Proverbs would agree with that sentiment here this evening. Indeed, the whole book of Proverbs is at heart really a message about how to live wisely now in the present so that you can secure your future, both your earthly future and your eternal future as well. And of course, as we mentioned in this series already numerous times, there isn't a direct correlation between following the advice here in scripture and seeing a definite um, security and success. The writer's words are good general principles, but they don't cover all eventualities, do they? The book of Proverbs is not a cover-all, foolproof insurance policy for your life, for your future. Sometimes we just have to admit that disaster strikes and it doesn't matter how wise you've been, Ruin just comes up close, comes your way. And sometimes you just find yourself in circumstances that are far too difficult for you to get out of, through no fault of your own. But generally speaking, God says, if you follow in his ways, if we learn from him how to live in his world that he's made, then we will avoid jeopardizing that future which is so rightly precious to us. And here in chapter 6, we get given three different ways, I think, we are at risk of jeopardizing our futures. The first one, pledging senselessly, or making foolish promises that end up demanding more than we ever expected. Secondly, working sluggishly, just expecting our future to be handed to us on a plate without requiring any effort of our own. And thirdly, living subversively, living in such a way that undermines God and the way that he's ordered the world all around us. Now, all three of these different ways to jeopardize our futures are serious and reckless and foolish. But the last of the three is definitely the worst of them all because that way of living puts our eternal future most at risk. But we'll talk about that more when we get to it. But for now, let's look at our first way of risking our future, and that is by pledging senselessly. Here, looking at verses 1 to 5. Making promises can be a very dangerous business, can't it? Especially when we make promises that we're not sure we'll be able to keep, or promises that will end up demanding far more from us than we ever could have anticipated when we made those promises in the first place. And surely Christians, with our magnanimous and generous hearts, 
I think, are probably more at risk of this kind of behavior than most people. We long to help people where we can. We look to how Jesus took our debts upon himself and we seek to emulate his kindness to others in our own lives. So we find ourselves saying things like this. I wonder if you've ever, you might recognize this, maybe not. Sure, sure, you need help with Grace Kids. Or, you know, you know me, I would love to help out. If there's any way I can serve in church, I'm happy to do it. For how long? How long do you envisage this happening? Oh, oh, of course, we can, we can iron out the details further down the line. That's fine. Happy to serve. Happy to serve. Before you know it, you've been running Grace Kids for the last 50 years of your life. What you'd perhaps thought was a short-term solution, a stopgap, has become a lifetime commitment. And of course, it's not a bad thing, is it, to commit your whole life to a ministry We've commended that recently with Grace Kids as well. But it is actually a problem if you don't have the capacity to do that, to come good on those promises, or if it will hang like a weight around your neck the rest of your days and make you resentful, then it really is a problem. And I think this idea comes out in our first few verses here. These verses picture the son getting himself into a bit of bother about what he is promised to do. He is promised, or he's at risk of of promising, to put up security for his neighbor or a stranger. In other words, he's made a verbal agreement with someone that kind of be their own insurance policy. So the neighbor can go and set up the business or start a new endeavor, whatever it may be. And if it all goes belly up, well, it's okay. He needn't worry because the son will pick up the pieces. It might seem like a very generous and kind action at first sight to offer that. But the writer actually says it's folly. Making thoughtless pledges like this, he says, are a surefire way to put your future at risk. Notice verse 2, that the son's words have trapped him. He's made a promise that he must keep. But he actually has no idea whether he'll have the capacity or the resources to uphold his end of the bargain. He's stuck between a rock and a hard place because what he has done is actually doubly foolish. He's made promises for a future that he simply cannot control. And he's put his own financial future in the hands of another. And that person could turn out to be quite the fool. Who knows? So the principles here, therefore, are don't promise things that you have no control over and don't put your future in somebody else's hands. Here the issue is with money. But you could put other commodities in place of money, couldn't you? Time, energy, career, service, whatever it may be, you can fill the space. Now, when speaking to my dad about this this week and what I was preaching on this Sunday, and he's not a believer, I told him what God was warning us about here. And his reaction was to say that this way of living sounded rather pessimistic and harsh. I was a bit slow in the moment, but my response should have been something like this. It's not pessimistic. It's not harsh. It's just really realistic, isn't it? And isn't it a wonderful thing that the Bible just seems to get us, even the most intricate parts of our psyche and our thinking? It gets how even our noblest desires and aspirations can become twisted and unwise and cause us problems. Is that not the case? That's certainly the case with me. I think one of the greatest apologetics for Christianity is that the Bible just totally understands us and the way we think and the mess that we can get ourselves in without even thinking. I find it quite easy to see myself in this son's position, how I might fall in the same trap as him, making generous but thoughtless promises I think I'm quite prone to that. Now, 
I anticipate that many of you will be there in the pews now trying to work out of these principles, not making open-ended promises and not putting your future in someone else's hands, really rings true of the examples we get in Scripture. And the obvious place we might turn for an example is the Lord Jesus, surely. And at first sight, it seems, well, he is willing to take on people's future debts, isn't he? He dies on the cross, not just to cover people's sin in the past, but their future sin as well. So surely we should emulate this kind of generosity ourselves. Surely we shouldn't be so hesitant about taking on people's future debts and making promises about the future. Well, don't be quite so hasty. There are a few things to think through first. We must remember that there are many ways in which we cannot be like the Lord Jesus that we'd like to be. First of all, the Lord Jesus is omniscient. He does not offer up his life for the payment of past debts and future debts without knowing the future in the first place. He knows when he sets his face to the cross that he can definitely make good on his promises. There is no possibility of our sin getting so out of hand or so vast that he is not able to pay that debt. Secondly, the Gospels repeat over and over again that Jesus was always in charge of his future. He never put his future in someone else's hands. He chose when he would die. He didn't put his future in anyone else's hands. And thirdly, the Lord Jesus was far, has far more resources at his disposal than we do. He is able to meet extravagant needs at a great cost himself because he is the infinite God. We, however, are very limited indeed. We are, we're finite. And one lesson that some of us might need to learn this evening is that we don't have the same capacity as the Lord Almighty. It sounds like it should go without saying, but how often do we actually fall into that trap and think ourselves have an infinite capacity? Some of us will think that there's just no ceiling to what we're capable of. These are the kind of people, I think, who you'll find serving on every single church rota. What's one more thing to add? I can do it. Sure I can. Well, if that's you, friend, your zeal is absolutely praiseworthy. But you may need a reminder that you are but a mere creature. And as a result, even you, with your high capacity, have your own limits. So folks, for once in church, I actually don't think that the Lord Jesus is the example we should follow here. There's something shocking to say in church. Not because that what he does isn't amazing, but because we as finite creatures just cannot do what he can do. He goes above and beyond what we are capable of. Rather, I think it's better to turn to another finite creature like us to see what we ought to do. I think we get a much better picture of what it is to be both kind and generous without overstepping into the realms of folly by looking at Paul's example. And I think the best example comes in the book of Philemon. In Philemon, we see Paul willing to take the debts of Onesimus, don't we? Or Onesimus, I can never know how to say his name. Onesimus, I think. This runaway slave who became a believer. Paul was very generous to him, writing to his master saying, I will cover any costs that he has robbed you of any service, you just put it on my bill. I'll deal with it. But notice, he only takes on debts that Onesimus has already accrued. He does not make promises to be security for Onesimus into the future. From that moment on, Onesimus is responsible for himself. And I think Paul's behavior here surely shares that same flavor of real gospel generosity with the Lord Jesus. He's unbelievably kind and generous to Onesimus, taking on his debts, doing what he can for a brother. 
But at the same time, Paul doesn't overreach his capacity. And he doesn't put his own future on the line by agreeing to things that he has absolutely no control over. I think this is what wisdom looks like for us finite human beings. But the question is, what do you do, actually, if you've already ensnared yourself by making these unwise promises? What if you've already made a pledge that you cannot keep? What if you have already jeopardized your own future by speaking zealously, generously, but thoughtlessly? What can you do? Well, if that is you this evening, then the writer of the Proverbs' advice of you is, whatever you do, don't you dare go to bed as soon as you get home after the evening service. Give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber, he says. Why? Because you need to act quickly. If your future is on, this, on the line, this future that we've already established is so precious to you, then you need to take action fast if it's at risk. And do what the writer suggests here in verse 3, and that is plead urgently with a person you've made this thoughtless promise with. For the writer says, whether you know it or not, you're like a gazelle or a deer being backed into a rock corral by hunters without you even knowing it. Ruin is coming your way soon, and you're just kind of sleepwalking into it. Now, I think the difficult thing about this advice that the proverb, writer of the Proverbs gives us is that the solution is made all the more difficult because of the initial problem. The problem was that you put your future into the hands of another. And now as you seek a solution to that problem, the solution is also in the hands of another person. You're at the mercy of the person you made those promises to, to release you from those promises that you made. But, sadly, what else can you do? You have no idea whether your friend will act honorably and with mercy or not, and you have no control over the decision they might make. But the sadly just isn't another option at this point. But to swallow your pride, admit that you've unwise, been unwise and spoken a bit too freely and too fast, and ask your friend to free you from the commitments that you've made. And pray that the Lord would show mercy to you as he is ultimately in charge of a situation, isn't he? And ask him to help you to show this generosity that you want to show to people, but to do it without drifting into unwise territory. So that's the first way you can jeopardize your future this evening and the solution. The second way we can jeopardize our future, though, is by working sluggishly. Here, looking at verses 6 to 11. And I just love how balanced God's word is. If the person most at risk of overpromising and overreaching is the kind of person who is just always on the go, always looking to help and to serve in whatever capacity they can, the kind of person who has that can-do American spirit and an industrial work ethic, well, then the person most at risk of jeopardizing their future this way is the kind of person who kind of rolls over in the morning with their eyes half open, looks at their alarm, and pulls the cover back up over their head for a few extra minutes. The kind of person you know, who just can't get started at work because they keep getting distracted and, working to their, and, and talking to their co-workers. I actually, I think, experienced this kind of attitude up close this week when I took a day off to look after the kids. I struck a deal with my two oldest children that I would take them to McDonald's if they helped me weed one of the beds in the garden, which was looking a bit too much like the Serengeti for my liking. Now, both the older kids, both of them, took a lot of persuading to get started. I think that's fair to say. Sorry, Lucy, you're here. I didn't realize you'd be here when I was going to use you in an illustration, but there you go. They're a bit slow to start, even with the reward of a McDonald's dangled right in front of them. And we'd be ha perhaps been working for around, I don't know, no more than five minutes, I'd say, 
when one of the children puts the trowel down, steps back, takes a look at their imaginary watch and says, Dad, do you think it's about time for a tea break? <laughs> You've been working for five minutes, I said to them lovingly. <laughs> that folks there, that attitude, is kind of the essence of a sluggard, I think, I'm afraid to say. And perhaps you can relate to this. Perhaps this point is feeling a bit close to the bone already. Well, that's the case. What must you do? Well, the writer says, look to the ant. See how he works hard. With no need for someone looking over his shoulder, verse 7. Not needing oversight because he can motivate himself and he is no slacker. And as a result, what is the outcome? Verse 9. He's the one who will have food in the harvest time. He's the one whose future is secure. So flip the idea on its head if you like. If you're a duvet lover, if you're a couch potato, keep slacking, keep doing the bare minimum, keep not working unless someone is there by your side, keeping an eye on you and telling you what to do, then what will happen come harvest? You'll have nothing to eat. Your sluggish behavior will be the end of you. And that's what he says. Verse 10, a little more sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the arms to rest, another tea breaks just five minutes into the starting work, and poverty will come upon you like a robber. Now, the sad thing is that I think when you're behaving this way, you think that you're stealing time for yourself. You think that you're stealing time for yourself in the moment, but you're actually robbing yourself in the long run. It's a classic case of shifting the work and responsibility onto your future self. Oh, future Andy, he can deal with this, I hear myself saying at occasions. But the problem is, your future self will have far less time and less resources to work with. As a result of your past laziness, and let's be honest, you probably still won't have all that great a work ethic in the future, even when the pressure's on. So the task will be made all the more difficult for you. So the lesson is, if you want a fruitful future, if you want to be someone who feasts come winter, rather than living off scraps, then you've got to put work in now. Christians really should be grafters. But we're the people who look out at the world with eyes open. We see that God has ordered things in such a way that it's a diligent who have food on the table. Yes, you might strike lucky and life might just fall on a plate for you. But that is so uncommon. And when that does happen, it's usually because you know someone who has considered the ant, who has worked hard, and you're just riding on their coattails. Now again, we must be careful not to think that everyone who is poor or who is going without is so because of a poor work ethic. I say that I come from relatively poor and a relatively working class background and a working class family, at least compared to most folk in Larbert. I think you're all rather well to do. But my family were poor, but it wasn't for a want of grafting, I'd say. And actually, the way things are set up in our country often make it really difficult for people to work their way out of poverty. Our benefit system is set up in such a way that people only get just enough to get by, never enough to invest, never enough to fund going back to college and retraining or to start a business of their own. And thus, people in those situations are somewhat straightjacketed, aren't they? And find it hard to work out those difficult circumstances. So, as is always the case, when we hear God's word, when we hear God speaking, let's not spend our time asking whether other people who we perceive to be poor are poor because they're lazy fools, but rather turn the gun on ourselves and ask ourselves if we are putting our future in jeopardy by being lazy now. 
And again, it doesn't have to be exclusively about money. We can become poor relationally in the future by failing to invest in the present. And I think that's a problem that us men are particularly bad at. We can jeopardize church growth in the future by being lazy now, expecting everybody else to do the work to be on the rota, expecting everyone else to do the work of evangelism. We can jeopardize the character of our children in the future by failing to grasp nettles when they arise, failing to take the effort to discipline them well, rather than just taking the route of least resistance, which is so tempting. So in what areas are you perhaps being a sluggard right now? And what might the consequences be in the future? Turn to God. Ask for forgiveness. Start doing what you ought to have been doing all along. For more often than not, we know what we ought to be doing. And ask him to help you to live wisely. That you might not rob yourself of a full and rich life in the future. Well, finally, and the most serious way in which we can risk our future is by living subversively. Looking here at verses 12 to 19. The first two examples, I think, are mostly focused on our earthly future, but not exclusively. Many people have indeed lost their faith, haven't they, due to foolish decisions that they have made. Financial pressures perhaps robbed them of joy in the Lord, and eventually they walk away thinking, a good God wouldn't let me live like this. Or they get burned out by thoughtlessly overcommitting themselves to everything. But this last example, I think, is more focused on the eternal future. The truth is, I think there'll be many, many foolish overpromises who make it to the new creation and many, many sluggards. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus' blood covers those kinds of sins and those kinds of follies. But those who purposely try and subvert God and deliberately cut against the grain of the world that he has made, sadly will not make it, because they are choosing to live as deliberate enemies of God. I think that's the point here in these last few verses. And that attitude is really summed up by this word worthless that appears in verse 12. Worthless is a word that only ever occurs in the Bible when it is talking about the godless and people who are enemies of God. The word is used in scripture for those who oppose God to his face, those who oppose God's people or God's king, God's justice, and also the social structures that God has put place in the world. In short, it describes a wicked person who hates God and all that God loves. That's why the person is described here also as being wicked. And this is a surefire way, not just to jeopardize your earthly future as you set yourself against all the structures that God has created in his world, but your eternal future as well as you provoke the anger and hatred of God, verse 16. So let's look at how people with this attitude jeopardize their earthly future first, and then we'll cast our eyes to the more distant future afterwards. Here looking at verses 12 to 15, And here the writer focuses on how this kind of person utilizes their body. With their lips, they speak crooked words. They're renowned liars. They're people who just cannot be trusted. And because they can't be trusted, they have to wink with their eyes and signal with their feet and point with their fingers They have to resort to charm and gestures to try and get people to do what they want. This is what untrustworthy people have to do. When your word alone is not enough, you need to utilize all that you have to try and convince people that they should trust you. I think we probably catch the best glimpse of this when we're playing a game in which lying and deceit is a crucial part of. I actually love these kind of games. Think games like Monopoly with sly backhanders or a game of risk promising not to attack that person you've said you're going to be an ally with 
but then striking just when the opportunity is right. That's the kind of attitude here, I think, but in a very malicious way. And how does this kind of person spend their time? Well, verse 14, they love to spend their time sowing discord, planting in the ground every evil thought that they devise in their heart. If you like, this is the kind of person I think we describe today as being a stirrer, but not in that charmful, charming, playful sense, which I think is just about possible, or at least I hope it is. They spend their time causing arguments amongst their friends, ruining any sense of harmony in their family by spinning tall tales and pitching people against one another. They're always looking for ways to cut against God's good order. They want to beat the system, get one over on the taxman, always do cash in hand if they can, dial back the clock on their mileage count to sell a car like it's almost new. Someone who wants to get something for nothing, even if it isn't due them. If you like, I think these kind of people are the malicious Dell boys of the world, the artful dodges, the Jimmy Cars. And sadly, most of society, I think, are actually at heart, underneath the surface, underneath pretenses, a little bit like this. Words are cheap these days. And most people, we're told, would lie on their tax return if they thought they would get away with it. And most families, at least that I know of, have their rifts in them, don't they? Because someone, somewhere down the line, has sown discord in the family in the past. But here's the good news. These people nearly always get found out in the end. These people who let it run its full course... Of course, all of us will be like this to some degree, but the people who live this way and live deliberately opposing God and the way he's created his world will be found out in the end. You can't keep opposing God and the way he's made things without getting hurt. It's a bit like gambling against a house. Not that I've ever done that, just so you know. But I understand from films that you might see temporary success, But the house always wins in the end. God will not allow people to exploit him or exploit his people or the way that he has made the world. They get caught up in the crooked words that they've spoken, get caught up in their webs of lies. They sow a little too much discord and they finally feel the kickback. Verse 15, as a result, calamity comes upon them suddenly and they're left broken and without healing. They spend all their time undermining every good thing that God has made, using people, exploiting organizations and systems that God has put in place. And when it all comes tumbling down, when the act is finally up, people realize what they're really like, they're left with nobody to help them because they've burnt all their bridges. They've exploited everyone near and dear to them, and thus they end up old and lonely. They've spoken so many lies that nobody takes what they have to say seriously anymore, even when they're telling the truth. And that reputation sticks. But it gets worse. For though they might occasionally get away with it during this earthly life, some people do, They live this way and they just seem to get away with it. That's why we have our psalms about why did the wicked prosper. They might pull the wool over the eyes of the HMRC or over the eyes of their friends and family or their employer, deceive them. But they can't pull the the wool over the eyes of the Lord. He sees everything and here we're told that he hates it. He hates what he sees. So not only do they risk ruining their earthly lives, their earthly relationships, but they risk ruining their heavenly relationship and their heavenly life that awaits them. For they incur the anger and hatred of God. Look with me at verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. This is a Hebrew idiom, which is telling us that these things are indeed things that God hates, 
but it's not an exhaustive list. There are other things he hates too. But nonetheless, if you match up with this descri description, you're in real trouble. You're provoking the anger of the Almighty. And again, notice all the body parts that the writer mentions here. A device he uses to kind of paint a portrait of what this kind of person is like. This kind of person has haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises evil, feet that make haste to run to evil, and lungs that breathe out lies and discord. He's describing here, I think, the antipathy of a Christian. But we're told, aren't we, that God loves the humble. He values truth in his followers. He preserves, preserves life and wants his followers to be wanting to preserve life as well. He desires what is good. He wants his people to be measured and focused on doing good as well. And he desires for his people to be peacemakers. When we think upon the teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, we're reminded that these are the people that God says he will bless. And therefore the opposite is true as well. That curse awaits those who match this unholy description here at the end of these verses. So what is the application for us Christians? Well, firstly, I think we need to be very careful not to assume that just because we come to church, that this description doesn't describe us at all. After all, I think it would be a good description, wouldn't it, of the Pharisees who thought themselves to be God's people as well. They were proud. They had haughty eyes. They devised a very wicked scheme to shed the blood of the Son of God and yet thought God was pleased with them. So we need to be honest with ourselves. And if we do see any of these character traits in ourselves, then we must take them to the cross and ask God to help us to crucify them, not to let them grow. If we find ourselves thinking that we deserve better than the person next to us in the pew, we put that attitude to death, because that is what haughty eyes look like. If we find ourselves being unclear with our speech, hoping that people will think better of us if they don't know all the details, we put that to death because that is the start of a, a lying tongue. If we find a speck of hatred or unkindness within us or find ourselves wishing ill on others, then we take it to the cross and we put it to death because that is the start of hands that shed innocent blood. If we find ourselves stirring the pot unintentionally, unintent sowing discord amongst people that we love, either for our own amusement or for our own benefit, we take that to the cross. For that is the beginning of someone who sows discord out of maliciousness. We either kill what is worthless in us now, or we risk losing what is dear to us in the future. This is, I think, really just the overwhelming message of our chapter. Speak wisely now, or live as a slave in the future. Work hard now, or be impoverished in the future. Repent and kill what is worthless in us now, or face the anger of the Lord in the future. Friends, your future is so precious. Don't jeopardize it. But the wonderful truth that we also need to hold in balance with all that I've been saying this evening is this. Even if we do act foolishly and we must face earthly consequences for the rest of our days for what we have done, consequences that might well be very crippling to us, our God has made a way that our heavenly future needn't be put on the line. All the folly we exhibit, all the complicated ways in which we sin will cause pain and problems for us in this life. There are consequences for what we do. And the cross doesn't always erase those things. But if we repent and trust in the Lord Jesus, if then we can be forgiven of our sin and our folly now and begin living rightly and fruitfully now. But more than that, we're also given a completely clean slate for all eternity. So though you might make an absolute hash of it in this life and face the consequences, 
there is a pure fresh start to come. And that is something to look forward to. Because Jesus lived wisely. And because he made good on all his promises. Because he worked hard and sweat sweat drops of blood for us. That is our future. As long as we keep doing things his way. And keep listening to his warnings. So let's give thanks for that. Let's pray. Father God, how we just want to bring our folly before you this evening. As your word is open, we realize in many ways these seedlings or maybe even full-grown plants that show these characteristics and tendencies in us. We can be so foolish in not thinking about the future, over-promising, not being careful, How often do we find ourselves procrastinating, not doing what we know we ought to do? How often do we find ourselves being malicious even, seeing these kernels of maliciousness in our hearts? How often do we want to be like the world around us who does want to cut against the grain of the way you've made things? Father, forgive us of these things. Help us to act wisely. And we pray that all our lives will be poured out for you. And we pray that as we do live wisely now, that we might reap the harvest in the future. That we might live fruitful Christian lives for your kingdom's sake because of the way we make decisions now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.